All right, hey everybody, this is Scott Juno Wonjian and Bing. Today's an extra special edition because I have Peter Lorge here and he is a recognized military history professor at Vanderbilt University. And today we're mostly gonna be talking about gunpowder because he published a book, The Asian Military Revolution, From Gunpowder to the Bomb. And uh, I've always been a big fan of his work and let's just uh, get right into it. So. My first question, um, well, you start out, you, the very first line of your book, I found pretty provocative. It's basically, <laughs> you argue that um, the Song Dynasty had already entered a gunpowder military revolution and was fighting as an early modern state. Yeah. And there's a lot to unpack there, but I kind of want to take everybody and go on this journey and find out all the context of what you're talking about. So the first question is, what is a military revolution and what does it have to do with an early modern state? And in particular, there's this whole thing in Europe that was going on, so. Okay, so, um, and, and I've been thinking about all this stuff for a long time. It's a very strange way. So of course, Jeffrey Parker wrote this book, The Military Revolution, um, which came out of his dissertation and this was the orthodoxy for quite a while. And more or less, I thought, you know, like a lot of people, I thought it was kind of this, the issue was settled. Um, mm -hmm. Joseph Needham did his whole thing and showed that Chinese, that Joseph Needham's main goal in, one of, one of his original goals in doing the science and civilization of China was to show that China in fact invented gunpowder. That was like a big thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that was, so once he accomplished that, he was kind of done. Mm -hmm. And then peculiar to Needham, he wanted to also somehow, he still had this idea that the Chinese were nonviolent and it was very, very there's some very weird stuff in there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but in any case, so I, I you know, it's a massive book when you, when you read that one volume and it's very hard to read. And mm -hmm. I, I don't recommend reading it to most people. I, I've had to read it multiple times because of my research. Mm -hmm. And and it doesn't get better with multiple. <laughs> it, it, but I and I don't want to I don't want to trash Needham too much. I mean he he did great things in starting a field. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's this question that comes out that you know okay so once we've established the Chinese invented gunpowder, then there's a separate question which which is sort of bypassed by people like Parker because it wasn't his issue, and Needham generally ignores it, which is what about the gun? Mm -hmm. and these are very different questions. Mm -hmm. And so for a long time, uh, and this was also characteristic of the field of, of the history of science and technology, which was somebody who discovered blank first, right? So, okay, well, we, we date it. This is, you know, ninth century, some uh, Taoist alchemist seems to have invented gunpowder. He seems to have discovered it. We know what's in it. Question solved. The Chinese did it first. We're done. And then we move to the next question, why when the Europeans really start reaching China, are the European weapons in advance of Chinese weapons in the 16th century, mm -hmm. 15th, 16th century. And then we get into huge questions of, which get to be very xenophobic and, and Orientalist and all kinds of ists and bad things where Europeans start claiming that somehow, uh, you know, well, you get, you'll get both sides of it, the Chinese well, the Europeans will claim of the Chinese and the Chinese will claim it of themselves that the Chinese are naturally pacifistic, which uh, is yeah. <laughs> a bizarre issue for military historians to deal with. And yeah. that has all kinds of things to unpack about it. But mm -hmm. that's, another, that's perhaps a long tale for another day. Yeah, yeah. And, and so then you end with this very strange question. You, you had this idea for a long time that people put forward that the Chinese never recognized the military value of gunpowder and they just used it for fireworks. And Needham supports that more or less. And Needham is very, he has this, and, and so what we end up with is this issue that aha, the Europeans, they get gunpowder, mm -hmm. they realize what it's useful for, and then they start using it. It radically changes military practice, which then causes social change. And then the big question for the Europeans is which came first, the guns or the state? Mm -hmm. the modern nation state or the mm -hmm. early modern nation state. Mm -hmm. And 
and there's there's a lot of they they kind of fudge it. There, there's mm -hmm. not a real because it, it seems to happen about the same time. Mm -hmm. So Parker writes this book in which he makes this argument that it's um, uh, so there was an earlier argument made that it was um, you know basically you 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 the revolution starts in in Sweden and then we get it no it starts you know so there's this then because. Parker's a historian of Spain. He's more interested mm -hmm. in that. Mm -hmm. And we have all this movement around and people trying to say, okay, so who's, who's responsible for this massive, this revolution? Mm -hmm. Okay. So then we start unpacking that. We go backwards. And, and so Parker writes that. Um, Ken Chase writes a wonderful book, uh, Firearms, A Global History of 1700. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, Ken's one of those just just extraordinary individuals. You know, it's way smarter than than I am by by huge amounts, and 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 he he makes an argument that the reason why the Europeans and to some extent the Japanese have this advance in guns is due to the kinds of threats they they face, mm -hmm. and in China they face different threats. So because military practice is different, you have a different development of guns. Mm -hmm. So this is your, your standard uh, necessity is the mother of invention kind of argument. Yeah, yeah. I didn't find that terribly, I, I, well, I should say, I found it convincing at first. And then as I thought about it, I found it less convincing. Mm -hmm. The other thing that you run into is that, okay, well, what about guns? So suddenly, as you begin to look at the Song Dynasty, and you realize they're producing enormous amounts of gunpowder, we have fragmentary evidence of this, mm -hmm. and they invent the gun. And that's yeah. kind of key. Yeah. Because whereas, you know, okay, we put some gunpowder in arrows and we light them on fire and we shoot them and they're very, they burn things up. That's very nice. That's just an enhancement of a pre existing technology. And then this is, oh, mm -hmm. well, we kind of get rockets. Okay. Uh, when you get to the gun, you are getting to something which is unequivocally a weapon. Mm -hmm. Unequivocally a weapon in ways that, say, a knife isn't. You know, we understand dual use, right? We understand mm -hmm. uh, bows and arrows can be used for hunting. Uh, we, they are also used for war. We understand knives can be used for all kinds of tasks and for killing someone. We get mm -hmm. to the gun. The gun is about killing people. There's, there's yeah. no question. You, the early guns are not, you, you're not going to go hunting with <laughs> one of these things. That you're not going to hit anything. Yeah. So, yeah. We have to overcome our sort of cognitive dissonance at this point. At this point, we realize that the Chinese invented guns. So if they were pacifistic, they were not very pacifistic because they not only did they invent them, we know that by the end of the 13th century, certainly they're producing thousands of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mass producing, and certainly in the 1080s. So in the 11th century, mm -hmm. we have evidence that they're producing hundreds and hundreds of thousands of pounds of gunpowder. I mean, I haven't done the calculation yet because there's this one shipment of it's like 660,000 pounds of sulfur from Japan. That's a and, lot. <laughs> yeah. And so we have the Chinese records of that. We also have the Japanese records of that as it happens. Oh, okay. So yeah. we know and the Japanese are kind of like, okay, well, you know, they, we got this big order, you know, ship them all the sulfur. Mm -hmm. And when you realize that sulfur is, you know, a smaller component of gunpowder, gun yeah. gun mm -hmm. so there's a lot being produced. And of course, mm -hmm. this. It seems this happens right after this invasion of the Kita, uh, it's not the Kitan, the, uh, the Tanga territory, uh -huh. but it may well be that they were, you know, it's hard to account for why did they suddenly have this huge shortfall mm. in sulfur production. Now, before that, they were getting sulfur as a byproduct of producing mordant, which is uh, for fixing dyes and clothing. Mm -hmm. So they had green and white vitriol, which they were making to fix dye and clothing. And it would, as a byproduct, have a leftover sulfur, and that was their source of sulfur for a while. Mm -hmm. That became inadequate in the 1080s, yeah. at the earliest, or sorry, yeah. at the latest. So it uh, could have uh -huh. been happening sooner. Uh -huh. Yeah, very, the records are very fragmentary. So they go yeah. and they get atmospheric or uh, sulfur. We get sulfur from basically volcanoes mm -hmm. in Japan shipped over. Okay, so now we know that there's massive production by the Chinese government of gunpowder by the late 11th century. Mm -hmm. We get into the 12th century, it's a century of tremendous warfare. And yeah. not surprisingly, we 
gunsmiths. We actually get visit, we actually get mentions of guns. So we're, we're, the gun is probably developed sometime in the 12th century, probably at this point, the later half. We definitely, we have examples by it. We actually have physical examples of 13th century guns. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we know, you know, here it is, here's a gun. And that's what's left over. And then we have all kinds of arguments. And they haven't found anything earlier yet. I think the earliest now is about 1251 or something like that. Mm -hmm. So Needham might have been right in his guess that 1200 is about a good date. Uh -huh. Yeah, and those uh, those early guns, they also are mass-produced objects. Yeah. They're not just like one-offs. Like, yeah, so yeah. We're, we're not. And, that, and so this is where it gets interesting with the idea of the, the nation state. And mm -hmm. um, so I'm... When I'm done with the, I'm working on a book right now, which has nothing to do with this. And then I've got a book after that, which I'm working, but, but after that, uh, I'm still doing stuff on gunpowder. And one of the issues, my working hypothesis right now is that, or my approach is that rather than looking at things from a purely technological standpoint, you know, mm -hmm. okay, we've got this. And I, I, I like to use the example, like in the cell phone, like when you have a cell phone, it's a toy. When mm -hmm. a bunch of people have it, it starts becoming useful. When everyone has it, it's, it's very different. Mm -hmm. But you could look at that technology, you could look at the way technology develops, and things could have gone very differently. You could have, you know, why do we put resources into that or not something else? Well, it was commercially, there were people who could make money off of it. Mm -hmm. uh, why did the government develop the government developed it for government purposes, for military purposes? Mm -hmm. So my working hypothesis right now is that you have the fiscal state, or at least the tax state, and I'll explain these, these, there's very specific meanings to these terms in a second, first. And that allows a state to take advantage of this pre-existing technology mm -hmm. and to produce it at, in sufficient amounts to actually be militarily useful. One of the things that people don't pay attention to is not just, okay, can you produce a gun? Well, okay, can you produce hundreds of guns. Okay, let's say you produce hundreds of guns. Can you produce enough gunpowder? That suddenly yeah. starts becoming a major issue. So we're mm -hmm. talking about production issues, if you will, business, not so sort of you think, you know, science, technology, and now we're down to business, we're down to money. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and we realize that their capital, they're trying to make use of this, this new weapon, this new technology. They are producing it. They are experimenting with it. Maybe not in the sort of intentional way we in the modern age think of it, you know, okay, you know, okay, here's this technology, you guys go figure out how to make this work better. But they are progressing, the weapon systems are progressing. And behind that is a huge government supply system that is built to produce, to gather and produce enough gunpowder, enough munitions, and distribute it back to the troops to use in war. And they were doing it. So mm -hmm. clearly they thought it was worth the effort. But the problem for us as modern people is we look back at that and say, well, wait a minute, why didn't, why weren't the Sung who now had this technology? And they overwhelmingly, had, they had it in much greater quantities, they had it sooner than the Jurchen, the, the Khitan, the Jurchen, mm -hmm. or the Mongols, yeah. or the, the, the Tengrits. Mm -hmm. Why didn't this technological advantage allow them to, you know, fight off the Mongols, fight off, you know, yeah. or defeat them? Mm -hmm. And that's the part that people don't quite grasp because people are stupid about technology. <laughs> they imagine that if you have that, you're going to, you know, usually there are no technologies that give you this, what do you want to say, unstoppable advantage. Mm -hmm. And everyone keeps imagining that there would be, right? You know, if all, well, if we had guns, then, you know, if you, you think about even uh, in America, why do the Europeans wipe out, you know, displace the, the, the native population? Mm -hmm. And is it just because they have guns? Well, not really. There's a lot of politics. There's a lot of diseases yeah. involved. There's a lot of, uh, and, and people don't like, and people don't like politics. They don't like to talk about, you know, we're the Indians politically organized to capitalize on their power you know mm -hmm. were they did they understand the threat well of course they didn't understand the threat yeah they, 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 no they, idea they, what was coming <laughs> well you know they, and there's not some guy who's going to be you know oh these these weird people showing up okay whatever you know we we deal with them we don't deal with them but they're not imagining that 
more and more and more and more and more of these guys are going to mm-hmm. come. Yeah. They're going to, you know, so you can't look at these guys and say, why didn't you see this threat? Mm-hmm. And then on the, on the other side, you can't say, well, the reason why you, you know, you, you drive out these people, you defeat them. Sure. You have guns, which are more efficient, but you know, the early settlers, a lot of them perished. A lot mm-hmm. of people died, but you keep bringing more guys in. Mm-hmm. And then of course, disease comes in and then you have politics and you have all, all of these. So it's not a, a, it's not a clean narrative of, I have better tech than you do. I win. Mm-hmm. The same thing the conquistadors, right? Mm-hmm. Oh, they've got metal. Yeah, but they also, they're allied with locals. Yeah. You know, they're not, they're not mm-hmm. just coming in and sweeping everyone away. That's just not how war works. So people have a simplistic notion of how technology relates to war. And, you know, if you will, uh, Vietnam uh, uh, was an example of, you know, America has better technology, but so what? You know, yes, yeah. it helps. Mm-hmm. I, I would yeah. rather have the better technology, but, you know, <laughs> there's more to it than that. So what we see is that the Sung, because by the 11th century, it is a tax state. And by a tax state, I mean, uh, if we're going to use uh, Joseph Schumpeter's definitions of this, a tax state is a state which takes in more revenue from indirect sources, which is to say things like business taxes, rather than primary producers like agriculture. What's also important in the 11th century is that the Sung state is producing vast amounts of cash. So it's becoming a cash economy. And by cash, I mean actual coins, but of course, silk is still used in various capacities for that. And there's gold and silver, which we won't go into because that gets other complicated issues. Uh, But they they are using it. Which means that what we see with the Sung is that we have what a a European historian would recognize as very much uh, early modern bureaucratic state. Mm -hmm. There is a rational bureaucracy. There is uh, taxation, regular taxation, so that you have a budget, you can plan for things. Mm -hmm. Sung budget was about 70% on average of... um, uh, uh, spent on the military. So we know that uh, Han Jo Wong's very old, but very useful dissertation on that. And, and most Chinese states maintained about that level of spending, which was about 75% of the central government's spending went to the military. And that doesn't, and, and by the way, it includes now, the current government, uh, the US government's about 50 some odd percent for our military. So this is pretty standard. Military is usually your biggest cost in a modern state. Mm-hmm. So now we have this very interesting thing that happens. And then in the, that, that it, is under a, it is under this bureaucratic state, under a tax state, that we have the exploitation of the technology of gunpowder to allow it to develop into guns, to develop into mass production of them and mass distribution, if you will, modern warfare unless you want to argue that modern warfare requires the three branches of the service. And that, that's a whole other argument. Um, that won't happen to the end of the 15th century in Europe uh, when, when the French march into Italy in the end of the 15th century. So we now have this situation in which we have the state comes first. And not just the state, but the economy. And the Sung economy, I think, is really key here. And in this, I show to some extent the bias of being a Robert Hartwell student who argued, God, ages ago, that uh, the Sung was the, the first almost achieved, they had a proto-industrial revolution. So the Sung is this bureaucratic state and it, it, mm-hmm. it looks like a modern state, it works like a modern state, and then it produces this military value. Once we get into the 12th century, the 13th century, we start going from a tax state to a fiscal state which is to say we start being, the state starts being able to borrow money because it has fiscal instruments, it has paper money, it can do things like that. So it's got all this great stuff. That will be by the way why England is able to bring up such uh, immense military power because it can borrow money, the, the state. But that's again, much later. So in that sense, I think at this point that there's a very direct connection between the what do you want to say, a tax state, a fiscal state, the early, the the bureaucratic state and the development of guns. And Mm -hmm. that that comes before, you have to have the technology, obviously, but it's that which allows the technology to be exploited. So 
that answer, I hope that answers that question, but that leads to then the second part, which is, and so why does it stop? Why does that mm -hmm. weapon development technologically stop? And it's because the North China is invaded, North China is invaded um, by the Jurchen, and most of this economic, technological, and state uh, power is concentrated in Kaifeng in Northern China. Mm. Yeah. It is also, uh, and uh, uh, William, uh, God, uh, William Liu Guanglin, wonderful book on, basically he points out that it's this Northern, in this early Song, it's the Northern water network, which concentrates the economy at Kaifeng. Also the military is concentrated at Kaifeng for political reasons. Uh, as I said, Hartwell of course made this big argument that Sung Kaifeng in the 11th and early 12th century has this proto-industrial revolution. You have coal, you have iron, all this stuff's concentrating mm -hmm. at this city, which had a population of perhaps 1.7 million people. Yeah. That is where the proto-industrial revolution starts, it is probably where the, the foundations of what will become guns start. And then the Jurchen come in, Kaifeng is lost, the northern, that whole northern economy is destroyed mm -hmm. and it is not rebuilt. Okay. But yeah. the fiscal state moves to the south with the Sung. Mm -hmm. And so gun production continues. The technology continues down there. But a lot of the early, that, that, that proto-industrial revolution goes away. The Mongols come in, things don't advance that much. Their approach, they stop coining. They don't really, the Mongols don't really coin, produce too many coins. They mishandle paper money. And, and well, and you know, because, well, I mean, let's be fair to these people. They're, they're dealing with a very new financial instrument, right? Yeah, yeah. They don't understand, you know, there were people who understood that if you produce too much of this stuff, it, it, it would be bad. Yeah. There, there were people, but, but it, you know, if you think about even today, a lot of people, don't really grasp these concepts of inflation and, and, you know, I mean, and, and, and th a lot of them are counterintuitive. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Economics in general can be very counterintuitive. So yeah. it's and, understandable and, that the UN, the, the medieval Mongol dynasty would not understand all the nuances of economic policy. Yeah. Well, and somebody tell them, look, we can't produce more of this. If we produce too much of this paper currency, it'll cause all these problems. And the guy going like, but if we just produce more, we can pay our bills, you know, it's like, <laughs> and so, and then the, the, the real thing that kills this is not so much the Mongols eventually conquering the Southern Song, although they mess up a lot of that stuff too. I mean, there is a wonderful story of the Mongols take over control of a gunpowder arsenal mm. and they, um, they get rid of the managers, the original, the Chinese managers, and what do they end up? They end up with a huge explosion because they mismanage it. Yeah. And they talk about tiles, roof tiles from this building being thrown miles away. Uh, because, you know, it, 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 we all know that safety is always, you know, there's always someone going, ah, you know, you, you, yeah. you don't need that. <laughs> so, and then what really kills it though is the Ming comes in and Zhu Yuanzhang, the first Ming emperor, demonetizes the, the Ming economy. Mm -hmm. And he tries to make all the localities autarkic. Mm -hmm. And it's, as far as I can see, what happens is Zhu Yuanzhang just obliterates the economy and he obliterates government finances and gun uh, development just comes to a screeching halt. Mm -hmm. By the time they start sorting out uh, the problems he's caused for government and the practices, the Europeans show up very soon thereafter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And suddenly they start seeing, oh, they, somebody else has got some really clever guns. They got some really good, so we'll, we'll just use those. Mm -hmm. But the, the economy takes their, I mean, uh, von Glan estimates it's really until the 18th century before the Chinese economy reaches where it was in the, in the 11th century. Yeah. So if we pay attention to the economy and not just technology, Mm -hmm. We pay attention to government organization and taxation systems and not just technology. Suddenly we go, oh, well, what happened was they undermine the economy yeah, and they undermine the government. And that's why gun production went where or it collapsed. Mm -hmm. 
And then by the time they sort of, things got started back around, the Europeans were already showing up with, with better guns and so oh, we'll, we'll adopt that. But they never quite recovered. They were, then there was always a lag time, right? You know, the Euros, first the Europeans are showing up or, or Jesuits who are like, yeah, I guess we can make you some cannon. Uh, and, and later they're getting guns and there's always this lag. And then there's politics. And then there's mistakes in war. And then there's, and so we, the, the previous narrative has been this kind of morality tale of how the West was, the West understands this stuff and nobody else did. Because, you know, if you actually look at what was happening, it's a very messy tale. And it's, there isn't a morality tale in there. And it's just kind of, oh, you know. So that, there, there's, my, there's my working hypothesis of how things okay. go yeah, when I get true. around to actually writing this stuff up. Yeah, well, it's, uh, everybody has projects years in advance. So yeah. it's good to plan ahead. So, okay, that, yeah. So that's a lot to unpack, let me think. Um, one question I have, so I, yeah, the political side coming first, I think yeah. is crucial. And um, the nature, so in Europe, it's commonly argued that, you know, they get this new gun technology and then they have to bureaucratize their states in order to produce this gunpowder and stuff. Yeah. Sometimes. Um, but one thing about China is the nature of, would you say that the nature of warfare and fortifications does not change as drastically with the introduction and adoption of gunpowder? I think, I think that's Europe? fair to say. I mean, guns don't, I mean, so there are changes and there's this aspect that we don't talk about that much with respect to China, which is to say naval warfare. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that too. So. And of course, the what's interesting about that is the early Ming founding is you know, tremendously based upon naval warfare. Yeah. And so they do have this thing where the at the beginning of some of the, the wars of what will become the wars of Ming, that where the Ming will come out of that, those mm -hmm. conflicts at the fall of the UN and they're, they're on rivers and they're, so they're driving these ships up next to city walls and the ships in a lot of cases have uh, tower, you know, castles on the tower. Uh, they're called castles, four castles, aft castles, which makes talking about the fortifications a little more complicated, but they're higher than the city walls so they can shoot down at them. Yeah. So they have to move the city walls back from the edge of the water mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. keep them from doing that and raise them somewhat. So there are these changes, but there isn't in China a sudden like we've got these cannon. We're now blasting the walls down. Yeah. So uh, there's a very good article by Kelly DeVries about this in Europe, which is uh, and the walls came tumbling down, which mm -hmm. is about how it's, you know it's not that neat. It's not like suddenly everyone gets cannon and all the medieval fortifications collapse or are blasted <laughs> down because people are smart and they do things like they build up, they, 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 they put earthen walls in front of their stone mm -hmm. walls. Mm -hmm. They put earth walls behind their stone walls. Yeah. Uh, they build barriers to keep you from getting close. So it's not this kind of, you know, this medieval knights in his castle going, you know, screw you to the king. And then the king drives up with a bunch of cannon, blows his walls down and says, well, I'm sorry, what did you say? And, and that, that causes centralization and consolidation, which was in a simple terms, the, the previous argument. Yeah. You yeah. know, <laughs> artillery favors the central government over uh, the regional powers. And, and mm -hmm. there was a whole book on the military revolution debate in which they showed that that's not the case. Mm. But everyone keeps looking for this very straightforward narrative because we're sort of technology obsessed mm -hmm. in that we want it to just be, okay, so the gun comes in, social change. Yeah. Why? Because it knocked the walls down the night. And, and when you realize that the ruling class in Europe didn't go away, mm -hmm. you know, it's not like they, they, their castles went away and suddenly they went away. They were still holding the land. They were still ruling the country. And in a lot of cases, they were still leading in warfare, even when they were no longer knights. Mm -hmm. So that, that's kind of a ridiculous idea that, you know, England did not become an egalitarian society uh, because the guns came in and, and ruined the aristocracy. You know, and, and, and in France, one of the reasons you, know, you get rid of some of the aristocracy is because they slaughtered them. Yeah. And that had nothing to do with guns or, or, or technology. <laughs> they, yeah. they went in and, and, and killed them. They had a revolution. Yeah. So, you know, the, 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 the notion, so it, once we move away from these simplistic 
notions, we realize that it matters what people decide to do. It matters what they do politically. It matters, it matters when you win a battle. You know, battles are not, uh, battles are one of the most contingent events in human history. Mm -hmm. And people would like battles or uh, certain kinds of people would like battles to be something that kind of, you know, we're better than the other guy. We're more moral. We're economically stronger. We have better technology. Therefore, the outcome of the battle is a foregone conclusion. The battle of the outcome of battle, first of all, is never a foregone conclusion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And second of all, very often you fight a battle and it doesn't matter. Win, lose, or draw. I mean, it's better to win, but just because you won the battle, you know, doesn't mean that you're going to get what you want out of that conflict mm -hmm. or that what you're going to want politically. You know, sometimes you can, I mean, think about uh, uh, the first President Bush, uh, they kick Saddam Hussein out of Kuwait and then he loses the next election. <laughs> I mean, he has, you know, something like 85, 88% approval rating the summer before, you know, the year mm -hmm. before. And then by the following year, he loses the election. You know, uh, Churchill is, is, is kicked out of office after World War II. Mm -hmm. Why is that the case? Well, it's the case because just because you have this military success, it doesn't necessarily get you the political outcome you want. Mm -hmm. or, or you could argue, look, oh, you're great in war, but I don't want you running things in peacetime. Yeah. <laughs> you, know, yeah. uh, you know, just because you did that doesn't mean I want you, you know. So war is this very messy instrument that doesn't give us the moral lessons we want, mm -hmm. as is technology, you know. And yet there's this obsession with, you know, who, who invented it first? You know, who mm -hmm. invented it first has a certain interest. It's, it, it has certain things that are important. Uh, when someone says, oh, the Europeans, you know, we have the scientific method. You're like, yeah, but you didn't invent gunpowder, guns, uh, the printing press, uh, movable type, the compass. You, know, you sort of go down this whole line, paper. Paper, by the way, which is a tremendously important thing, mm -hmm. which people forget about with respect to printing. Yeah. Like, you know, you're trying, you know, you're going to print on vellum? You know, that's too expensive. You need a cheaper yeah. medium. Mm -hmm. So there's always this production aspect that takes the technology and makes it from a novelty into a significant technology. Mm -hmm. And then how that technology is used marks, and if you, you, know, you read my gunpowder book, it matters who gets the technology, at what point in a political or a military struggle, where things are. I mean, it's not like a, we got the guns, we're gonna win, it's like, we got the guns at a point where we really weren't able to exploit them. And then because we got them, our opponent then got them, they were able mm -hmm. to exploit them much better, we lost. Yeah. Or we got, you know, and, and, and so there's not this, and, but that's always, that's the professional historian versus the sort of, um, you know, a, a, a popular version. Mm -hmm. That's why people don't want to read the, the professional historian. They want to read the popular version because it's, it's too complicated. <laughs> the popular version is oh and this happened and then it was very clean and you know what is it max boot has this whole thing on you know technology driving war and you know technology doesn't drive war and and tactics are are very important leadership uh, social organization mm -hmm. weather climate you know all of these things and then some of this and and it's uh and someone wants the simple answer, you don't have, you know, I've had students say, you know, okay, after you, you ask this question, you problematize it, so what's the answer? I'm like, well, there's not an answer. Yeah, <laughs> welcome to history. <laughs> yeah, welcome to history. You want, to, you want a simple answer, go talk to a political scientist. You know, they'll, they'll yeah. give you a, a, you know, this is what it is and, and, mm -hmm. and you'll have a simple answer. It'll be wrong, but it'll be simple. <laughs> yeah. All right, yeah. So you touched on naval warfare there. Um, yeah, uh, also, there's this, also this other question I have about um, the tactics of using gunpowder weapons early on. And we know that volley fire was a thing with crossbows uh, yeah. pretty early on, as early as like 7th century in the Tang Dynasty, or possibly yeah. much earlier. Yeah. Um, but a lot of people who talk about the de development of volley fire in, uh, with gunpowder. Yeah it's a huge mess and there's you know europe and japan and uh, korea and the ming and all this other stuff and uh do you 
it might not just just might not exist but do you know of anything with the song dynasty well we and, i mean i can you know wujing zongyao talks about I, I i won't talk about let's say guns and folly fire but mm -hmm. wujing zongyao which you know where the preface is 1044 mm -hmm. has crossbow and bow volley fire yeah yeah the, the song so, has crossbow and vol i mean mm -hmm. the, the 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 what the i've never understood the emphasis on volley fire mm -hmm. in the European context, I always thought it was very much of a red herring. It was kind of one of those things that it was mentioned as some significant thing. And, and I was always like, why, why does that matter? And, and no one ever seemed to question it. They just kept talking about it. And then mm -hmm. someone would say, oh, well, we had it in Japan. Oh, okay, we have it in Japan. And so, oh, we have it in Korea. Very good work on this done. So, oh, well, we have it in, the, have it in China and other contexts. Like, this is not a complicated thing. I'm not really sure I understand what- It's just like is. taking turns. <laughs> well, and that, that you fire on command mm -hmm. and that trained people, they, okay, first line, you know, shoot. Okay, second line, shoot. You know, mm -hmm. the, 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 I guess the, you know, certainly, you know, the longbowmen were firing in volleys, the, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, I honestly, I'd have to go back and try to figure out what on earth the original issue was it, it never made sense to me yeah you know it, it, it's very often you find there are sort of uh, what do you want to say not not that they're like big issues they're just kind of like these accepted these things which people end up in an argument about or trying to prove who had it and it's it's really not clear that it's important and and so you know and so sometimes you come into the argument later on and everyone's talking about it so you're like i guess this is important so um i, I kind of go with this and and then you know you find it in your oh well, i found volley fire and so, oh very mm -hmm. good and you're like, and, you're like okay, why? and 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 you never examine why that was or was not important you know and and yes for it it seems like a good organizing principle it's hard to imagine that it was very rare. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. It seems yeah. like, yeah. The more important thing with guns is that you have to look at the development of guns with respect to naval warfare and fortifications. Mm -hmm. Because particularly since early weapons are slow and inaccurate and also often used more for, you know, burning things than uh, killing them with the, the force of the projectiles, Mm -hmm. ships and walls allow you to carry heavy things mm -hmm. make slowness not the same issue and particularly with respect to ships but also with respect to fortifications if you can burn something that's an awesome capability yeah yeah so i mean that's why when we talk about uh you know the arquebus the hakenbus which is a, a, a hook gun and it's a hook gun because you hooked it onto the wall to absorb the you know the, the recoil Mm -hmm. So you can develop those technologies. And then on top of that, you're in a city which has manufacturing capability. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when you look at navies, navies are your most expensive, highest tech aspect of your, probably in your gov entire government. You mm -hmm. know, in China, of course, you get things like water control, which are pretty amazing in astronomy and things like that. Yeah. But ships, warships in general are the highest tech things around yeah. of any society. Yeah. And so that's where your cutting edge technology is and on your fortifications where you can, you can afford to shoot slowly mm -hmm. at big targets, yeah. you know, whereas if you're out in the field, you know, some of those, those limitations are, are more significant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, certainly. Now, if we go back to Kenneth Chase yeah. and he's arguing that because China has to fight nomads and the early firearms were not as useful against nomads, um, therefore, they didn't have the impetus to develop the small arms as quickly. Yeah. Uh, but at what point would you say um, these firearms did become effective against nomads? And it's probably 19th century. Uh, okay. I mean, you know, you can make an argument earlier. Uh, you start getting in the 19th century where you have. Manchus, mm -hmm. you know, horse archers charging at British troops, mm -hmm. gun them down. Yeah, yeah. 
And the difference comes in that there's, they are able to shoot more quickly and with mm -hmm. greater accuracy so that the Manchu tactics of charging at these guys, you know, so Manchu is going to charge at you, choose a target, choose an individual and shoot three arrows mm -hmm. at that individual before he veers off. That's their training. And because these are very powerful bows, uh, the Manchu bow is the most powerful of the Eurasian bows. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's shooting a really thick arrow. And, and yeah. so if it hits you, you're dead. Like a, a mini spear. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're, hum they're humongous and, and, and they're very scary. Yeah. And the problem is when you start being able to shoot at a greater, you know, you have a better chance of hitting something at a, at a greater distance. You have greater volume of fire and you can keep it up. So, you know, it's one thing if you, and this was, you know, early, this same thing happened in Europe, which was, you know, okay, so these guys have guns, if we can charge at them and they only get off one shot before we encounter them, you know, uh, you get this with, uh, 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 Machiavelli talks about how useless guns are uh, in his, not in, you know, in his Art of War, which people should read, not just the prints. Yeah. But he, he, yeah. He, he talks about, well, you know, the guns aren't really that effective because they shoot once and then the, you, you know, if you're brave, you, you get through that and you get to the, you get to hand to hand and then you can defeat them. And those guys using guns are cowards anyway. Now, and if you want to think how stupid this is, keep in mind that this attitude was maintained through World War I. That if you could motivate your troops enough, they could overcome the firepower of yeah. machine guns and, you know, <laughs> you know, and the, the, the Russo-Japanese, or the Japanese took hideous casualties trying to take Russian lines, was mm -hmm. instead of them going, wow, that was a stupid way to run one to wage warfare, people went, see, with enough motivation, you can overcome <laughs> modern weapons. <laughs> and and any rat, and a rat, there were a couple of people who went, oh, I don't think that was a great idea, but there were people because the the people who are employed the, the generals tend to be aggressive people and they are all looking to prove they're going to make a morality tale out of warfare and how do you wage warfare well if we're moral if we're brave we will over we will we will defeat our enemy because we are braver and more moral than they are because we are better people and so mm -hmm. the point is that if you win the war it shows that you are a better person mm -hmm. and so this just means that we have to be even more brave and even, you know, <laughs> yeah. charge. and, and, you know, it, it's just kind of a dumb thing. And yet this persists, right? I mean, this mm -hmm. world war one is this, the, the ultimate example of this kind of uh, ideology that drives people to it. So, yeah. So the Manchus in the 19th century are still imagining that they're going to ride at these guys. Now, of course, the reason why they could imagine that was because, earlier guns were inaccurate and slow enough firing that it did work. And the problem is in the interim, they fire, they get more accurate, they start firing faster. So suddenly, you know, instead of you charging and these guys are gonna shoot, they're probably not gonna hit you. And before they can reload, you're gonna be, you're gonna hit, you're gonna hit them with arrows and turn away. Suddenly it's like, they're actually hitting you at the outer edge of your charge. They're hitting you all the way through. Yeah. You know, so suddenly you're not launching three arrows. You know, maybe you're getting an arrow before you're get, you know, you're really taking fire. And so suddenly, so it's the 19th century where, and that's even before you start getting rifling. Because mm -hmm. once you start getting rifling, you know, we talk about uh, the desolation of the battlefield that happens. And, and this starts to happen. You start seeing it even in uh, the American Civil War, where suddenly the, the whole issue of charging, you know, lining up into these big lines and advancing into this fire, once guys start getting rifles, let alone the repeating carbines and things like that, mm -hmm. the ability to charge a line, a uh, 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 fortified, and that, that's the thing, you know, beginning of the American Civil War, no one's digging in. The troops who remain, you start getting into that Civil War, every, they, they entrench the moment they stop. Yeah, yeah. And they there, are, there are generals who are concerned about it. No, no, stop! Don't, don't entrench because, because that if you entrench, that will harm your offensive spirit. You'll, you'll stay on the deep. And there, and people are like, no, no, they're, they're doing it because they've been in battle. Yeah. <laughs> and 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 you know they know that if they need to entrench, you know. So right near here in Nashville, we have you know the Battle of Franklin, 
and you can go out and see where the actual, you know, the lines were that were. And, you know, the, the Hood's men charged these, you know, entrenchments, and they were shooting at virtually point blank range at each other. And a relatively small number of Union troops stopped this whole charge and just inflicted, you know, hideous casualties on them. And again, same, they had equivalent weapons. You know, what they had was it's a question of generalship, of tactics, of understanding limitations, how you deploy them, you know, entrenchments, all of these things and ground. There's a whole, there's a whole issue in that battle of, you know, there's a bunch of guys who are, there's a dip in the ground. So they're actually shielded from most of the fire. And then they come up when they're needed. And uh, this is like a shocking thing. So mm -hmm. the, the, that technology is really not, uh, it's, it's not a, a, a simple what a deciding issue. Definitely you want to have better technology if you can. And by the mm -hmm. 19th century, you know, cavalry in general is starting to go down. And, and to go back to World War I, there were still people who were trying to use horses in World War yes, I. Yes, yes. And they were very disappointed to find out that horses really, you know, cavalry, horseback cavalry really wasn't that useful. It was kind of annoying because like, I want to get on my horse and yeah. charge, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was the purview of the, uh, you know, you would say like upper classes too. So they were thoroughly disappointed when they didn't have the opportunity to show their glory and stuff. But <laughs> Yeah, well, you always see the statue. They're always, oh, the general's always on a horseback, right? You know, that's, that's. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, but that leads us to this question I have about uh, General Chi Ji Guang. Yeah. You've written about this before where yeah. he writes the Ji Xiao Xin Shu yeah. in the 1560s. And he has all these chapters and he talks about, you know, fist fighting and archery yeah. and all the other things. But later on, he writes it. He, re, he revises it, and when he revises it, he's like, okay, guns and spears is everything. And um, so for him, what do you think was causing that transition? And the one in particular, he was fighting a lot in the North before he yeah. revised it. So was he seeing something about, was it like a pike and shot style thing that he was using with the nomads or? You know, I, I wish, I wish there were more research. He, he's a very pivotal figure, not necessarily because he was such an important general by itself, but because of writing the Jisha Shinshu mm -hmm. and also his other, his interim text, the one that comes between that. Yeah. Uh, because so what you actually see is this guy trying to figure it out, right? Mm -hmm. You have an early, a 1560 text, uh, I forget what the date on the, the early, the, the middle one was, and then a revised version. Yeah. So he, I think the middle, so it's like, he goes from like, what is it like 16 chapters to nine to, to you know, so he, he's, he's trying to figure it out. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, Baron Van Nordum has done a very good study on him. And, and there, there's a, there's a lot to be done on Chi Ji Guang that hasn't mm -hmm. been done. I think they're doing some of it and it's going to be very interesting. And, and, you know, I, I have written on Ming history. I do not consider myself a Ming historian. Yeah. yeah. Uh, occasionally someone Someone wants to dress me as a Ming historian. And I'm a Song historian, so that's like offensive at that point. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but but um, so my two guesses, I think it's two. I don't want to start getting into a Monty Python routine here. But my two guesses are so one one there's the he goes up to the north and fights the Mongols, and so he sees a different kind of combat. The second one, which may be related, so they might be connected, which is that when he first goes down to the south to fight the pirates, he is cobbling things together. He doesn't have a lot of supplies. He doesn't have a lot of equipment, doesn't have a lot of firearms. So he's trying to work with what he's got. And instead of having hereditary troops, he's got, he's recruiting new guys. So, okay, how do you take raw recruits Mm -hmm. transform them into soldiers. I don't have a lot of guns. I'm going to have to cobble stuff together with this other th things. Uh, okay, let me do that. And I'm fighting guys. I'm not fighting guys on horseback. I'm fighting infantry. I'm fighting guys who are on ships. Mm -hmm. They're very good hand-to-hand -hand fighters. They're not big archers. Then he goes up to the north and arguably, I think the two things that happen is one, he's got professional soldiers already. So he doesn't need to train them in the same way. He doesn't need to, okay, let's make you aggressive. Yeah. 
And the other thing is I think he's got more guns. Mm -hmm. So suddenly he's, you know, if you don't have guns, you, uh, you've got to come up with some substitute. When you have enough guns, suddenly you say, okay, well, I've got the guns. I mean, if, so if you took our, our, you know, the Marine Corps and you said, okay, guys, uh, we're sending you out there, you don't have any guns. Or you, you know, <laughs> okay, you know, what, what you, okay, well, we're gonna have to cobble some of this together. I mean, if you meet Marines, they'll be like, oh, we'll figure something out. You know, <laughs> drop us behind line, we'll be, we'll be aggressive. Uh, but uh, your, what you have, changes what you think about. I, you know, I was just having actually lunch with a, a former Marine last week, the week before. And the question comes up, you know, I am not, I don't walk around armed because I don't live in an environment where I think that's necessary. But there are people who live in the same environment who do think it's necessary. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now I might be right, I might be wrong. Mm -hmm. If I were armed, what would I be armed with? You know, what, what do I think the threat is? And so if you're telling me that I have a life or death threat that is imminent, obviously I want the most weapons, most effective weapons possible. Mm -hmm. If I don't have that threat, then, you know, I don't really need it, right? If I don't, yeah. you know, it, it, you know if it, and then you go into the other problems of, you know, if I have the weapon, does that convince me to get into situations that I wouldn't otherwise get into? Because I've got a mm -hmm. gun, so I'm gonna, you know, go. The military guys don't think that way because they're military guys. They're put in a situation of military, you know, they are mm -hmm. in the life and death situation. Mm -hmm. So, you know, yeah. Chi Guang's up on the border and he's dealing with the Mongols. He's got guns, he's got walls. His, he has cavalry. Mm -hmm. They are not as good as the Mongol cavalry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. His bows aren't as good as the Mongol bows, but his guns, he's got guns. The one advantage he's got, he's got guns. And he's got a supply of them. So he suddenly goes, okay, the only way I'm going to defeat these guys with a gun. Now, I, if he could have gotten sufficient guns to deal with the, the, uh, the Woko, Woko, yeah. Then I presume he would have used them. Mm -hmm. What would be nice if someone, some Ming historian to go into and actually look at his supply situation mm -hmm. and figure out, you know, what, what was he being supplied with? What, yeah. were, what were his limitations in carrying that out? Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, how much hand-to-hand -hand combat does a modern military train the soldiers in? Mm -hmm. Not much. Yeah. And th that's rational, right? They're not expected to come into hand-to-hand -hand combat. But if you look at some of the conflicts, uh, my next book, which will be out at the end of this year, early next year, has a whole bunch. I ended up having to deal with a lot of the Marine Corps in uh, Guadalcanal, places like that. The Marine Raiders were using knives a lot. I mean, in battle, in fights, they were fighting yeah. in, at, in the dark against Japanese troops who were using knives. You know, they're fighting at night, trench warfare, grenades and knives. And that's, it kind of blew my mind that, yeah. that, that was, that was important. That was useful. Mm -hmm. And so how much do they train with knives now? I'd have to ask some, you know, somebody in the, in the military. They just don't expect that. Yeah. I can't imagine as much. I mean, they, I know they do a little unarmed, but that's also not much. It's just kind of the basics. But. Yeah. And if you don't, and honestly, look, our police don't do that much. Yeah. Yeah. And the police have a much greater likelihood of, of getting into a, a, a fight with someone, a physical altercation, mm -hmm. than, than our soldiers. Mm -hmm. And so we end up with this situation of like, you know, so I think Chi Chi Guang was, was responding to the circumstances, his experiences, but also his supplies. You know, oh, I got guns. Well, if I've got, if you've got guns, then you're going to go guns and spears. Yeah. If you don't have any guns, you've got to, you know, the, you're going to need bows. You're going to need other weapons. But if you got guns, go with the guns. With the guns, yeah. Uh -huh. And so, in that sense, Chi Ji Guang encapsulates this change in warfare, this possible change in warfare, happening in the 16th century. Uh, the Manchus certainly spend great effort to acquire troops who know how to use cannon. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you know, when you look at uh, Wakeman's uh, 
the great enterprise. You know, there's a lot of there's a lot of battles there with a lot of cannon, a lot of firearms in the Qing conquest of the Ming. Mm -hmm. So this notion that like somehow the Chinese are not, this is not happening in China. It's just, you know, it's just completely false. They're, they're, they're having these huge battles. And, and to my mind, that's one of the important, the reasons why I, I'm a great advocate for military history, apart from the fact that I do it, so I would like it to be more acknowledged, yeah. is that when you deny another country, another people, nation, however you want to describe a group, when you deny them a military history, you deny them volition, you deny them uh, credibility as a group. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that happens is one of the reasons why China is not, doesn't get a military history is because it, it makes them a, not really a culture, not really a group. Mm. Uh, the Japanese, they fought, you know, yeah. the Europeans, they fought, the Chinese, they were all about peace. And then there were these Manchus and they screwed things up, but they were violent, you know, so they're like, well, wait a minute. And, you know, and I don't think that's necessarily a good thing, but mm -hmm. it is true that people mm -hmm. look at military history justifies your society, military history, winning a battle somehow proves you to be valid. Yeah. It mm -hmm. you. And so by not allowing China a military history, it allows outsiders and, and Chinese people too, they, have it, they use it for their purposes. If you don't have a military, if they don't have a military history, you can make all kinds of ridiculous generalizations about them as a society. You know, it's like this notion, oh, the Chinese people didn't do laws because, you know, uh, Confucius said that laws were not there. It's like, well, he said that you shouldn't be ruled, it's bad to rule by laws, but they had laws. <laughs> we have all the legal codes. And you know, these people, oh, the Chinese didn't have laws. Of course they had law. You know, you don't run a huge empire without laws. I mean, you have bureaucracy, mm -hmm. you have regulations, you have laws. Mm -hmm. They were deciding legal cases all over the place. We have case law from the 13th century. You know, we, we, so th this, there are all of these, China is the great civilization that we, that is used as a counter to the West because mm -hmm. it has this uninterrupted history. Mm -hmm as messy and complex as those issues of Chinese history are. And one of the ways that they are, their history is made a, a, a clear reflection for us is by demilitarizing them. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly we get this, well, in the West, we advance through war for better or worse. And that's why we're in control of the world now, not necessarily because we were willing to enslave people or exploit people, but because, you know, we were better at technology and fighting. And the reason why they didn't is because they didn't do that. You're like, well, the Chinese did and enslave and expand into all kinds of people because they yeah. did do that. And, so, and they're more equivalent and there's a lot more similarities. There are differences, obviously. So, and then when you make that, suddenly it becomes messy and then they, people can't just sort of say, those Orientals are like this mm -hmm. and we Westerners are like, what do you mean we Westerners? You know, the... the the huge difference is there. And so, you know, as I said, but this gets back to the academic is, is focusing on the complexity, mm -hmm. not the simplicity. And yeah. you know, sort of the, uh, you know, what, uh, I guess the Seinfeld comment about, you know, they, they're still using chopsticks, right? You know, yeah. <laughs> you're know, like, well, you know, and of course I was feeling, I always laugh at that too, particularly because I've gone so much, I, I've found so much I have to have chopsticks by my stove when I'm cooking because they're so useful when you're picking things up. You drop something by the, the, the pan and the fire's going, if you have chopsticks, you can go in there and pick it up and, and put it back in. You know, it, it's so useful for all kinds of things. And, and uh, but you have that kind of lesson that the fork is just objectively superior to chopsticks. <laughs> And therefore, using chopstick is somehow some kind of perverse antiquarianism. Yeah. Uh, you know, I want to be traditional and use, you know, as opposed to it's a different implement. And, mm -hmm. and, and uh, or, or as my daughter was eating something the other day, uh, so I made fried rice, actually. I said, why don't you use a spoon? She said, well, I want to use chopsticks to be, you know, I'm, I'm trying to be, you know, kind of authentic, if you will. And I said, Chinese people would just use a spoon. Yeah, with fried rice, you use a spoon. <laughs> you use a spoon because they're, they're not, so they're, of course, if you're Chinese though, you don't have to try to be authentically Chinese. Yeah, you just when be yourself Chinese, and you are Chinese, yeah. You are Chinese. When you're, when you're not Chinese, you're like, oh, I want to be authentically Chinese and the Chinese person, I would, yeah. you know. It becomes this whole performative thing. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I'm being authentic. I'm using chops. You know, I, I was, uh, 
being driven back to the airport by this uh, Korean graduate student when I was in Korea at one point, and he had, we had to stop for lunch. And he looks at me, oh, you know, you're, oh, you use chopsticks. And, and I, I, I was, I just sort of said to him, yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't want to say to him, looking at his age, I said, look, I've been using chopsticks since before you were born. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm a Chinese historian, you know, I, you yeah, know but, yeah. but for him, it was, you know, uh, you know, whatever his experience of Americans was, you know, this was, this was a strange, this was, or this was noteworthy. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. and so we 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 glom onto these very strange but rather unimportant distinctions, mm -hmm. in order to make larger morality tales that are just silly. And you know, you, it's not going to advance your understanding of the world or how 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 things flow in history. Yeah. So okay, I have another question. This one is about a different book. So okay. the Gunpowder Age. By... Oh yeah, yeah, Tony Andrade's book. Uh huh. Yeah. So he makes this argument that, you know, this talks, we were talking about the West and the China, like the West surpassed them. When did that happen and why? So Andrade says that it's because during the start of, or in the 18th century, basically, you had the, this big, this long period where China wasn't fighting as much and Europe was fighting a whole lot more. And therefore their guns kept developing while the Qing's yeah. kind of stagnated. And I wanted to get your thoughts on that argument because you made this more argument based on economics. Yeah. What well, would you say and, about the Qing and- Yeah, and, and yeah. so I will, I will also point out in all this that I never reviewed Tonio's book because I had too many conversations with him while he was writing it. Oh, okay. So, and by that, I mean, there were things that I said that he incorporated and I showed him some of my he was looking at research that I haven't published. Mm -hmm. So his thinking is very much consonant with mine. Mm -hmm. So that's why I never felt comfortable. I was like, I can't review a book. That you have. Where in some, in some or... sense, it's for me to review the book, say, yeah, where he agrees with me was absolutely smart. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, so I do agree with the notion that more fighting led to advancements in technology. Mm -hmm. I don't think that it is, this is back to the necessities of the mother of invention kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's the whole story or even maybe the major aspect of it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think if you look at what's happening in Europe, they are, there's a lot of advancement that's happening almost below the level of what we see in the sense that there are plantations developing for production of saltpeter. Mm -hmm. Because one of the major issues is how do you get enough saltpeter? So uh, the British, the major source for British saltpeter for a very, very long time is Bengal. So they're getting Bengali saltpeter. I mean, there's massive production. This, this is, and in fact, Bengal still produces huge amounts of saltpeter, very important source. And that is not plantation created. That is, the conditions are such that there are certain areas where it is more readily available and we won't go into the whole processing thing. Uh, so in the interim, if, so having more wars creates more demand for gunpowder. Mm -hmm. Therefore, there are people who are developing to supply things. Now, there are two accounts from the Florentine government, uh, 14th century. We have Florentine government account books. And basically at the beginning of the 14th century, they are purchasing the individual components of gunpowder from a spice merchant. Uh, what's the guy's name like? That sounds expensive. Giovanni Battista, something. I forget the guy's name. I, I can find the guy's name somewhere. He, um, well, so the shift is very, very interesting is, so at the beginning of the 14th century, and remember, the major cost to any state is war. Mm -hmm. So they're buying the components of gunpowder and then they're gonna, they're gonna mix it. By the later part of the 14th century, they are buying barrels of gunpowder from multiple suppliers. Yeah. We don't know how big the barrels are because there's all barrels, you know, whatever. Yeah, yeah. So um, now, of course, this is a very good reason why I need to go back to Florence 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, Research and, purposes only. <laughs> no. I am, I am absolutely willing to go all over Italy as necessary to bring to the world all of this important research. <laughs> yeah. I will drink as many espressos as I have to. Yeah, uh, yeah. As much as, as I have to. I mean, and I do that for all of you people out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm willing to do that. Yeah. Uh, so there are two copies of the, these accounts, by the way. One, one's in the, uh, what is it, uh, Biblioteca Nazionale in Florence, and also the other one in the uh, Ricardian Library uh, there. Mm -hmm. So what this shows us is there is a commercial development. There is a significant shift going on underneath all of the stuff that we're paying attention to, where they're going from, oh, we've got this technology, how do we get this to work, where suddenly you're getting military contractors. And not, not the condottieri, but the, you know, uh, you know, arms manufacturers. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. The arms manufacturers are getting orders. They are starting to get money. So the system, you know how this thing, the government puts money into it. Suddenly, mm -hmm. there's a lot of people around who want to do that. They're trying to innovate. And they're trying to do this mm -hmm. thing. So what happens in Europe is, I think, and, and this would be to some extent consistent with, with what Tonio was saying, there is demand because there is war. And consequently, there is production. And because there is production, there is innovation. Now, I don't think it's necessarily the case that it's like there's a guy on the battlefield going, gosh, if only I could get this gun to do something else. It's there's somebody producing this who's trying to come up with better ways to produce this. You know, when the yeah, Dutch figure so. out how to bore um, centered uh, barrels so that the guns will be more consistent. Mm -hmm. And so that you start getting all of these things where they're, they're working the technology out. And in China, they're not doing that. Mm -hmm. But one of the reasons why they're not doing that is not just that there is a lack of war, but lack of war is important, right? There's not this demand. Mm -hmm. But by the 17th century, they've got European guns coming in. Mm -hmm. So they have got this technology. They're like, oh, that's cool. We'll build that. The state is not ramping up production, but in China, gun production, gun powder production was monopolized by the state. Mm. So they weren't letting you could, now of course there were firearms out in the community. Yeah. So that's the other thing, there are these fouling pieces. Mm -hmm. And uh, this happens in Japan too, where there was actually this notion, you know, without getting into the whole nonsense of the giving up the gun stuff, which never happened. Uh, there was an acknowledgement point that there's all kinds of guns out in the Japanese countryside. All sorts of people have guns, you know, keep your tigers and hunting and things like that. So there is private production there, but there's a very big difference between private production and state production. Yeah. The state is very concerned about locals getting weapons. If you look at things like mm -hmm. uh, Sumikan stuff on the White Lotus Rebellion and things like that, where they actually, these, re these rebels have a hard time actually getting access to enough weapons. You know, having mm -hmm. local, local blacksmiths make knives and stuff because the state's looking out for that. The state doesn't want the citizenry to get armed because when they do, they start to try to overthrow things. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and the, and, and the Qing state never has a very large military mm -hmm. to control things. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's, you know, the Manchus themselves, the banner troops are very few of them. Mm -hmm. And of course their effectiveness is declining over time. The, the green standard troops, the Chinese troops is what, 600,000 of them, 660, I forget what the number is, scattered mm -hmm. all about. You know, then there's kind of local, there's not a lot, it's not a heavily militarized society in that sense, but the state's very concerned about weapon production. Whereas in Europe, you have states in conflict, but there's a lot of money too. Mm -hmm. Where the Qing yeah. state doesn't take in that much money. Mm -hmm. Kong Shi screws that up. I mean, Kong Chi hobbles the state by fixing the taxes based on what's it's a 1713, because 1711, 1713 census, uh, you know, he, he was well, so a tax rate. And he says, we're not gonna raise it. No one can raise the taxes. So the state is losing money because the, the economy is developing and you have inflationary pressures and the state's collecting the same amount of cash. Mm -hmm. So they can't increase their military. They can't do that. So I, I, so I guess I would say is, I agree with Tonio that that's making it so the European weapons develop. But there's also on the Chinese side, and it's not just that they're not fighting. Mm -hmm. They're also, you know, we have an attitude now. We 
look at technology as this thing which obviously advances. Pre-modern people did not necessarily imagine that, you know, oh, well, you have this gun light, it looks like this now. Man, mm -hmm. if someone were to work on that, it will become better mm -hmm. in the future. Uh, you know, we, we're always like, oh, I got my phone. Oh, it's my phone. I've had it for two years. It's maybe it'll, it, and I'm going to need a new one. And, 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 you know, they're trying to sell you these phones that can do more. Like, I don't, do I need that? But you know, your phone's going to get better over mm -hmm. time. You know, all your technology yeah. get better. It's not, I don't think it's a fair criticism of pre-modern people or even pre-20th century people. Mm -hmm. And, and keep in mind, this is also in Europe. It's not, it's not like everyone in Europe is like, oh, yeah, there's going to be, you know, when you think about what happens with industrialization, there's a lot of resistance to it. Mm -hmm. People don't necessarily think this is a, a, an objective good. Yeah. Particularly yeah. when you look at, you know, states, places like Manchester and, and London, mm -hmm. you know, polluted and it's horrible. You know, the, the Prussians go to, to London to see uh, early industrialization. They're, they're horrified. Yeah, <laughs> this is awful. You know, this is the people are the the the, fa the, fa the mines are terrible. The factories are terrible. People are living hard. We don't want that. Somehow we want all the benefits without any of those costs. Yeah. So, yeah, it's it's war. Well, let's put it this way: it with the technology existing, and with the coming what will be the industrial revolution particularly, you know, 18th century, whatever, always, it's always this joke, you know, 1750, okay, Industrial Revolution starts in England. <laughs> uh, but there is a shift. But before that time, before these guns get to Europe, is there any technological development, despite all the wars? It's like, well, they, no. I mean, there's no, so you, it's, you get this technology, it is advanced to a certain point. So the, 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 I guess the important thing to say with the Europeans is the Europeans get the gun. Mm -hmm. They don't get gunpowder. They get gunpowder and guns. Mm -hmm. And for a long time, it doesn't advance. And mm -hmm. you know, we're compressing this, right? We talk about, you know, we're like jumping centuries here. Yeah, yeah. And then at some point, early modern state, you know, bureaucratized state, wars mm -hmm. because of the structure of european society where states don't really have their own arsenals in a lot of cases and they are contracting out to private makers you know private arms uh manufacturers mm -hmm. things are advancing so yes i would agree with him that having wars under those circumstances mm -hmm. led to development and in china not having wars under their circumstances mm -hmm. led to lack of development. But again, if you're in China in the 17th century, 18th century, and these Europeans show up with better weapons and you say, oh, okay, we'll buy those. And yeah, you just start those. using theirs, yeah. <laughs> what do you, you know, until, until you get to the 19th century where the Europeans are actually a threat to mm -hmm. your state, mm -hmm. There's no particular reason for you to worry about that. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, the opium war, that, you know, that, that's a big surprise. Mm -hmm. But it's not like the Chinese weren't buying arms and duplicating European arms. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, they, they, and they do fall behind. They do, they intellectually, and I think this is the, well, the ideological perspective. The Chinese do not have an ideology uh, an intellectual orientation in the 17th, 18th, 19th centuries of we really need to be developing these weapons ourselves. We need to be trying to advance them ourselves. It's just not there. Mm -hmm. You know, and arguably it's not, it's not there until, you know, post-revolution. It's, I mean, I suppose you could almost say that it's not in, it doesn't exist in China until after the Great Leap Forward uh, or when they kick out, when it's after they kick out the Russians where the Russians withdraw, the Sino-Soviet split, where suddenly they go, okay, we're gonna to have to figure this out ourselves. Yeah. And, and, but even to this day, there's arguments, you know, that the Chinese are mostly, well, up until fairly recently, highly uh, reliant upon acquiring foreign technology and duplicating it, copying mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. That and recently that has changed, mm-hmm. but they still lag in a lot, and they're, and they're very aware of that, right? They're 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 explicitly aware of their technological limitations, particularly with not just well, I should say not just with respect to military hardware, but with respect to computers. Mm-hmm. And they're saying we need to have independent, we need to have our own production, we need to be advanced, we need to get to the forefront, mm-hmm. and so. This is a very long story, and maybe they are turning that corner now. So, but that's 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 your your historical tale versus your, uh, if you will, your political science tale, which is history. You know, you have it, you're going this way, and suddenly it veers that way, and then it veers back that way, and then, you know why? Well, because something happened, and it's not that <laughs> you know we had the technology first, so therefore we're going to have the tech, we're going to be ahead of everyone. And, but the other lesson to that is, is also true, which is just because the, the, the West, however you want to constitute that now is technologically ahead, doesn't mean that's written in stone. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, that, that, that can change tomorrow, that, that you know, some new technology could come out which could dramatically change the world. We assume that would come out of some American or European lab, mm-hmm. but Maybe not. Yeah. Uh, and and what that tech and of course it's always that issue what that technology would be, which you know it's that uh, what is it the unknown unknown the the thing that you can't even imagine that shows up and radically changes things that doesn't happen that often. Mm-hmm. But what would it be? You know. Okay, that actually leads into or that got to a question that I was going to ask, which was about when did China kind of start catching back up? So, and uh, this also ties in a little bit into, they were uh, recently, Ian McCollum, who runs Forgotten Weapons, he's writing a book about uh, guns or pistols used by the warlords in China. Oh, and yeah, it's it, it looks pretty interesting. But um, I know that, you know, they were using fairly modern equipment uh, up till then and in World War II, but it was not really uh, local production. Yeah. And yeah, but that you, you're basically saying that now um, that it was the leaving, parting with the Soviets is what really drove their. Well, yeah, I mean, and, and keep in mind that until fairly recently, and I, and I have for a number of reasons, Paid a, spent a lot less time talking about contemporary uh, Chinese mm-hmm. events. Yeah, uh, and it may still be the case. I know. I know. A couple of years ago, it was the case that Chinese pilots, even on their most advanced jets, didn't want to fly a Chinese jet unless unless at least one of the engines was Russian made. Mm. <laughs> apparently, jet engines are very very hard. I mean, you know, these these very high end are yeah very very hard to get right. Mm-hmm. And so on the one hand, you know that the Chinese government would like to catch up on that. Mm-hmm. And we're seeing these issues of technology transfer become much more of an issue now. You know, when China was far back, people were much more forgiving of, sure, we'll let you have this technology. Mm-hmm. Now, as they start getting closer, right? Now yeah. you start saying, well, maybe we don't want to give you the best technology, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, and then you have issues like, you know, they, they develop these, you know, uh, the Russians and the Chinese develop these hypersonic uh, missiles and mm-hmm. and suddenly we were like oh shoot we don't have those so we we went and produced a few mm-hmm. and and this, I mean of course this shows you the kind of idiocy of an arms race right which yeah. is that okay so you create this temporary advantage but you're not going to use it mm-hmm. yeah. and and so your opponent looks and so so we suddenly said oh I guess we need those so now we create this so, so you close that gap mm-hmm. and now you're back to zero again. And you just spend mm-hmm. an enormous amount of money to create a weapon system, a really complicated weapon system that, uh, you know, and, and so the Chinese military has certain strengths now. They have production, mm-hmm. they have autarkic production of a lot of things. There's, you know, there, you know, this is the, uh, there are smart people there too. Many of them have exactly the same training as anyone else uh, anywhere in the world. A lot of them have come to the West and studied. So there's not a, a there has never been an intelligence gap. There's never, and so now there's not even a training gap. 
So now you get into these issues of, so what do you want to do? How is the government going to marshal its resources and what should they do with their resources? Uh, I mean, I look at it from, you know, we're talking about military stuff, but let's say someone in China invents, you know, a cure for the common cold tomorrow. Well, does it honestly matter to us whether it was produced, it was invented in China than if it was invented here? If it works and there's no side effects and it's a great medicine, doesn't it benefit everyone? Well, weapons yeah. are not like that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and there are guys playing these, you know, war games and looking at, you know, oh, well, here's, if you went there, if he did that and he had a weapon that could do this, we could do that. And, and so we end up spending an awful lot of money mm-hmm. and, and time and energy. And, and, you know, I look, I don't want to say it, it doesn't hurt my profession. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, <laughs> You know, if, if there's, you know, I always said, if, if there's war with China, which, you know, which would be a terrible, terrible thing, it, it does make people who study Chinese military history uh, more important. Yeah, mm-hmm, certainly. That, that's not the way I want it to happen. Yeah, 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 yeah. But, uh, uh, you know, so, so the, the, these, is China catching up? Yes. Will they, there's a big question in economic development with China, though, which mm-hmm. is, China is not a democratic and free society. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, it's the democracy of the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, but without disputing that, will there come a point where Chinese economic and technological development is hindered by its political system? Now, there are some people who would argue, of course. Do we know that to be true? I mean, we can make certain arguments that maybe, well, you know, if you're a scientist, you know, we have scientists in the United States who are driven by greed. Mm-hmm. I'm no objection to that. I, I'm not, you know, greed is, is fine. You know, that it, we all have greed to some extent. So now if you are gr- driven by greed to make a wonderful product, then I'm very happy, right? You know, mm-hmm. I, you know, Jeff Bezos didn't create Amazon out of the goodness of his heart. You know, he wants to make money, <laughs> make a lot of money. Okay. <laughs> You know, and I can now buy something and, and have it show up really fast. Isn't that a wonderful, it's very convenient for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, doesn't mean I like the guy, doesn't, you know, but, but I got the money. I, I, got, I got convenience out of it. Mm-hmm. If you are someone driven by desire to make money, and that's what's been, if that is what has been driving innovation, and I, and I don't want to use that term in the more general sense, because I think there's a lot of, you know, at the university, always, oh, innovation, I don't know what the hell that mm-hmm. is, you know. Because you know, at the end of the day, I'm still teaching more or less with the exception of my PowerPoint presentation, the way anyone's taught for a couple of thousand years. You know, yeah. I walk into a room, there's a bunch of guys, a bunch of people, you know, they take notes, I say stuff, they write it down, they ask me questions, I give them my, you know, yeah. this, this has to be the same. You know, now I've got a PowerPoint. Okay, click, click, click. Okay. So but, but, but by, by innovation, I mean, not just I can get my shopping remote, I can get online and order food and have it show up. Wonderful stuff. I mean, in terms of scientific development, whether what, and this is the question, is what is developing important scientific and by extension military developments, is that driven by the ability of someone to say, I've got an idea, I create it and I make a lot of money. And if I can't make that money, if I can't keep that money, it's not worth it for me. Now, some people are like that, not everybody. Not everyone wants is is doing it for that. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm in the academy. There's a lot of people who work very hard, and you know, I'm not saying we, you know, we're not. It's not a question of being poorly paid, but you know, work very hard at something, do scientific research or any kind of research because they're interested. And it's not even like that. They want. I mean, honestly, they don't try to save the world. They're interested. You say to me like, why am I doing what I do? I don't doing it because I'm trying to make the world a better place. I'm doing it because I'm interested in it. Mm-hmm. You know, I can make it. Oh, I'll save the world, but. So when you look at these, will there come a time when, like the change from the Sung to the Ming, when the political system, social organization, financial organization, whatever you want to call it, puts a drag on certain kinds of development, makes it so that they're not as technologically responsive. They're not as economically responsive. Mm. And if you're the communist party, you might look at that and say, even, even if that were true, you might say, well, I'm willing to pay that, right? 
as long as we're still making enough money, as long as things are still advancing, not a problem. And as long as we stay in political power. Whereas, you know, if we allow freedom, maybe we'll have, we'll lose control of things. You know, <laughs> freedom to make money, freedom to advance science might also lead to political instability. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, the advantage of the democracy is we, we accept a great deal of political instability. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, it's, and it, it allows for it. And so, yeah, you can, you can have a crazy idea and, and go pursue it. And, and most of the people with crazy ideas are wrong because they're crazy. <laughs> and some of them, you know, uh, Elon Musk is not, a, is not a character who would function well in a more restrictive system. No, no. <laughs> Uh, will will he turn out to be uh, you know he certainly he has driven forward the electrification of cars and mm -hmm. and things like that in ways that wouldn't have happened as fast without him mm -hmm. but would they still happen well probably mm -hmm. yeah uh, so you know will China catch up in you know if you go if you're in Shanghai Shanghai doesn't strike you as as different than any other international city no it's very similar. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know, you are, and, and it's fine, right? You go out to the countryside, there's a lot of development still to go. But, you know, I'm down here mm -hmm. in Tennessee, you go out to the countryside here, it's not necessarily all that wealthy or well developed yeah. either. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Does everyone have cell phones? Pretty much. Does everyone have cell phones in China? Yeah. Internet mm -hmm. penetration? Pretty much. Uh, yeah. So I guess that, I mean, ultimately, a question of catching up is a question of what do you, you know, what would that mean and, and why would it be significant? You know, mm -hmm. uh, we would all dream of a world in which everyone has enough to eat, has, you know, good medical attention, you know, medical care, decent education and can get on with their lives. Mm -hmm. uh, how do we get there? Is that a technological question? Is that an economic question? Well, it's both, but also an ideological question, mm -hmm. political question. And, and that's where people get really worried. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, you know, there, and there's a lot of people they don't, you know, there are outcomes they don't want. Mm -hmm. You know, there are that's and then we get into very political issues that people will get very excited about and, and start mm -hmm. arguing. Uh, whereas I can talk about Sung history, and they're probably not going to argue with me. But, you know, yeah. you start talking about priorities in terms of contemporary society. And then, and, and... yeah, well, yeah, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'll save you from that fire yeah. <laughs> well it's certainly not recorded you don't want that up recorded you know if you have a conversation with them, you don't want to be on picture well, well, yeah yeah <laughs> well um thank you so much for your time and wonderful discussion and i you know i learned a lot and i'm sure that the viewers have learned a lot and it's just been oh. great so well and thank you thank you for having me you know uh, it's a good warm-up the term starts in about a five weeks six weeks so mm -hmm. Occasionally nice to come out of my uh, shell and, and try to form not just sentences, but paragraphs. Yeah. <laughs> All right. All right. Yep. Have a good day. See you later.